Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Matt Naylor, and I serve as the President and CEO here at the National World War I Museum. And we couldn't be happier than to welcome you here this evening to this wonderful uh, presentation that I'm sure that you're going to find uh, tremendously stimulating. What a great night to be here together. This is the sixth of eight in the series. And uh, they've been so wonderfully attended tonight. Probably is the largest attendance of them all. Congratulations, you're pretty close to setting a record. Um, that's certainly a testament to the, uh, to the uh, quality of the speakers that we've had and particularly to tonight's presentation. Check out the website of the Midwest Center for Holocaust Education. We also can listen to podcasts of the previous presentations as well, mchekc.org. Uh, that website list is on the postcard as well. None of this, none of the speaker series nor the uh, exhibition would be possible without the support of our sponsors. They're listed on the evaluation sheet that you have there. We are so deeply grateful for the generosity of the many individuals, corporations, and foundations uh, that have been supportive of this program. Representing one of our lead co-sponsors uh, from the Sosland Foundation is Josh Sosland. He also serves as president of another of our funding organizations, the Jewish Community Foundation of Greater Kansas City. And the Sosland Foundation, of course, are great friends of Kansas City and important philanthropists that help to create the sorts of uh, civic uh, pillars and civic organizations that help make Kansas City what it is. And so I'm delighted to introduce Josh, who will introduce tonight's speaker. Um, a, a, a wonderful evening I know that you'll enjoy. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Josh Sosler. Thank you, Matt. Sharon Pucker Revo began her career in television at WGBH in Boston, where she became an award-winning film producer. She has worked in the field of film archiving and Jewish film for longer than 30 years and has taught at Brandeis University for more than 20 years. Sharon lectures widely on the history of Jews in cinema, a field she helped pioneer. In 1976, she helped establish the National Center for Jewish Film, a nonprofit film archive, distributor, and, and exhibitor. Uh, under her leadership, and Sharon serves as executive director of NCJF, the organization has grown to become the largest archive of Jewish content film in the world outside of Israel, with more than 15,000 reels of film. She was an early advocate for the inclusion of film in the study of history and culture for, for the historically accurate use of visual materials. Sharon has consulted with filmmakers from around the world and has appeared in many uh, documentaries and television programs. She has curated innumerable film festivals and series uh, for venues worldwide. Sharon has been honored for her work by a wide range of institutions and organizations from the Melton Center for Jewish Studies at Ohio State University to the Boston Film Critics and several others. Her honors include the Tzvi Cohen Leadership and Legacy Award in recognition of her contribution, vision, and commitment to preserving Jewish cultural life. Sharon holds degrees from Brandeis and the University of California, Berkeley, but the source of pride for many of us here is that she grew up in Kansas City. While Sharon and her brother Bernie Pucker had moved away from the city by the time I was growing up, I have more memories of their late parents, Ida and Joe Pucker, special people in our community and my family's lives for many years. Having known the Puckers uh, family for so long makes this introduction a genuine privilege for me. Sharon? Thank you. I'm actually delighted to be here this evening and to return to Kansas City. It's been a few years since I've been here. Um, 
I'm actually uh, very moved to be back to the community and to see really it's just uh, beautiful greenery and wonderful buildings and so well kept. Uh, we've had a, actually a wonderful couple of days and I would encourage all of you, please, if you haven't spent a few hours at the exhibit across the way at the National Archives, it's really just quite extraordinary. So as I say, I'm delighted to be back here again. Um, uh, I'd also just uh, very briefly like to thank uh, Jean Zeldin, who was the person who invited me, and uh, we've been talking about this for a long time and about the exhibit uh, and the wonderful work that uh, her organization is doing. Uh, just one quick introduction. Um, my daughter, Lisa Rivo, is now the co-director of our National Center for Jewish Film, and uh, she is with us today, and she's just been fabulous in helping us reach a new level of the kinds of uh, um, public programmings that we're doing all over the world. I'll talk about a few of those in a moment. But uh, Lisa is here with me, so uh, thank you, Lisa, for uh, all of your work. Okay. A few words about my background here in Kansas City. Um, I'm a third generation. My grandparents actually came here, uh, some even before the turn of the century in the 1880s, uh, from uh, near Budapest, and the other came uh, immediately after in 1910, 19, uh, 19, uh, 3, 19, 4. I actually grew up in a multi-generational um, household. My grandmother spoke Yiddish. She spoke English, too. But of course, she spoke Yiddish with my parents when they uh, didn't want my brother and I to understand what was going on. Uh, it was a fairly observant, uh, Jewish observant home, uh, but uh, one of the, I think, really important things for me was I began to think back later when I became involved with the National Center for Jewish Film and I began teaching courses on film in the Holocaust. What was my first memory of? How did I become introduced to this topic? Uh, and um, I recall that in our home there was one photographic book that was like on the coffee table or in the living room and it turns out that it was a book uh, of photographs by Roman Vishniak, which has now become you know, quite famous. Uh, I remember seeing the photographs of the children with the payas and the, you know, the traditional dress and uh, all of those wonderful photos that were taken in Opsa in 1936 and 1938. So that was one of my sort of visual memories of at least European Jews. Um, the second uh, was that uh, we had a wonderful photograph in our house of my grandmother who lived with us when she was a young woman. Uh, it had been taken before she had immigrated to the United States in 1904. Uh, and it was a photograph of her. Uh, she was a very beautiful young woman. They said that she was absolutely gorgeous. She had long blonde hair. And in the photograph, she's wearing a very, very nice dress and jewelry. And um, I shared a bedroom with my grandmother. And I remember her talking about how terribly poor they were. And I think she even told me that she never really had a tomato or seen a tomato until she had come, um, you know, across the ocean. And I guess maybe I was nine or ten years old, and somehow it just didn't fit together. Here was this photograph, and here were these very sad, difficult stories that she was telling me. And so I sort of confronted her, and I said, but Bubby, you know, it doesn't make sense. And she says, ah. When you go to have your photograph taken, the photographer gives you the clothes and the jewelry before he takes your photograph. So that image of her on the mantle was really a false image because it was manipulated and so who knew? So those are some of my early recollections, at least, of visual memories that come, you know, from Kansas City. Um, and then I remember when I went to Brandeis as an undergraduate, um, there was a film series. And one night we went to one of the films that was advertised in the series, and I remember sitting in a balcony in old Ford Hall, and they showed Triumph of the Will. Well, I didn't know anything about Triumph of the Will. I almost fell out of the balcony. And then, not until very soon thereafter, I went to an art class, and we saw Night and Fog. Night and Fog, 1955, Alan Renee. Well, I wanted to, to vomit. I mean, the, the, the images were just so horrific. 
but nobody talked about it in context. Suddenly, the teacher was talking about how the film was made and what the footage was taken and its color and the music and the guy that wrote the script, and it was all this technical discussion about what a fantastic film this was that had gone to the Cannes Film Festival. So those are some of my early recollections of being introduced to this incredible period of time that we now call the Holocaust. Well, luckily my education uh, was as a political scientist. And uh, later, as Josh mentioned, I became a public affairs producer at WGBH. Um, and it was in the early days before there were schools of uh, television and film, and you could go to those kinds of things. And so um, I actually went to work at GBH the week that Kennedy was assassinated. And uh, there I learned how to make film. And I learned how to manipulate images. We used to shoot in 16 millimeter film. And we would go out, I remember one series that I made had to do with education and how the public education system really wasn't fulfilling its promise. We, we were doing it in association with the School of Education at Harvard. So what did we do? We staged it. We put some kids in the back of the room and we made them look bored and so then we took the photographs of them and then we cut it in. I became a master manipulator. I also did the news at 10. Uh, on WGBH. Everybody else was asleep. So I learned that I could write whatever copy I wanted. I could throw into the wastebasket uh, uh, anything that I didn't want to be seen on the news at that hour. So I had this incredible opportunity to work in a film medium before there were, you know, the proliferation of images that we had today. So I actually got to do it myself so I know how it's done, so that later, um, when I had the opportunity to create with my colleague Mimi Krant this National Center for Jewish Film, we acquired our first collection uh, in 1976, uh, that was my background. So I was brought to that, this, um, the, all of these kinds of experiences. And um, one of the things that immediately, uh, you know, I was struck by was that film itself, 35 millimeter, 16 millimeter, 8 miller, those were the means of production for the entire world only from the late 1890s up through the creation of videotape in the 1950s, but later as a home media in 1979. So we're dealing with a finite period of time in which these materials were produced. Film also is perishable. But now, thank goodness, with new technologies, we know that if we find film, we preserve it, and if we restore it properly, put it in dry, cool, cold storage, it will be there for us for 150 years. In 1983, after we had created the National Center for Jewish Film, and by the way, we think we have about 15,000 cans of film, uh, many of which we know at least what we think they're all about, but we haven't actually opened hundreds and hundreds of those boxes to actually dig down deep and see what a lot of those items are. This is my one advertisement for the evening. We have no film of Jewish life in Kansas City or in this area of the Midwest. West. So if any of you have home movies, any kind of movies that were taken, whether it's a, a, a bar mitzvah party in the backyard, or whether it's some kind of a ceremony, or if your parents owned a store downtown, and it's Silverman's or Hertzberg's or whatever it may be, please see me after, because we collect and continue to collect, and it's the critical mass of these materials that allow us to have this kind of a collection and then to be able to share them with the world. In 1983, our archive was invited to present one of our restored films, Fischke de Kremer, The Light Ahead, which is a Yiddish feature film, which is one of our specialties and for what we're very well known for, at the Berlin Film Festival. How could we say no? I mean, we were being invited back by the German government to say, look guys, we're still here even though, anyway, it was an extraordinary experience. And so while we were in Berlin, we made appointments with the cultural minister and the reason that we did is that we wanted to ask them for copies of the anti-Semitic Nazi materials that had been made under the Third Reich. 
I was very fortunate, the president of my board at the time, a man by the name of Arnold Picker, had been president of United Artists, and so he had the right connections. So we went to a number of meetings in 1983 with the cultural ministry at various levels, and they finally said, well, maybe they would make us copies, and there was a whole big you know, back and forth. At one point, one of the gentlemen turned to us and said, well, it'll be X thousands of dollars for you to buy these films. And I said, buy these films? You're asking the only Jewish film archive in the world to pay the German government for these films that you made of people incarcerated, some of which we're going to see in a few moments? Any rate, it was finally negotiated. We finally received copies. And so the good news is, is that our archive holds 35 millimeter pristine copies of some of these most notorious of these materials. They're all in cold storage. They'll never go away. They will be there forever. We have shared them with uh, certain of the other archives around the world, uh, but uh, we have these materials, and especially the Eternal Jew, um, in multiple copies in multiple places. Uh, it's just never going to go away as evidence of what happened. Okay, uh, so now we come to what the exhibit is all about. But I made a deal with Jean Zeldin. If I was going to show these negative images, she had to give me 10 minutes to show what was destroyed. What was the vibrancy of life in Europe, the Jewish people, the diversity of that culture, before it was destroyed? And so we're going to begin tonight's program by showing three short clips of some of the materials from our archive. By the way, any of you that have been to Yad Vashem in Israel, when you walk into the exhibit, there's a marvelous wall. Uh, of, it's a video art created by a woman by the name of Ravner. And in it, you see little windows. And in the windows, you see film of various uh, places of the vibrancy of, uh, of Jewish life. One of the other places that some of these materials have recently been shown, um, Simon Shama just did a series for PBS called The History of the Jews, and there's about 40 minutes of our film that our archive has saved that has been now recycled into those materials. They're all the positive images. They're the, what life was really like. So Dave uh, Wilson, who is in the booth, is going to help us. We're going to, I think, lower the lights a little bit, and you're going to get to see um, three separate clips. And I can, the first two are silent, so I can talk over them. I'm supposed to have some light here on the podium, which I do. Uh, and we're just calling it, you know, a little bit of diversity of life from before the war. The first clip is Nova Grudek. Uh, it was taken in 1930 in Eastern Europe. It's a small, well, it was, it was really a town of about 10,000 people taken by Alexander Harkavi. Harkavi had come from this community to New York. He produced the first uh, Yiddish-English primers. Uh, he was a publisher. He made a lot of money. He went back to his hometown, Novogrudek, and he took this wonderful material. We actually have 40 minutes of it. He also put the Yiddish and the English intertitles in it himself. So you've already seen the orphanage. Here you're seeing just a snippet of the Jewish hospital. The man with the bow tie is Harkavi himself. Self. And you can see that people are fairly well dressed. This is one of my favorite scenes that I love to show young people. There were cycle teams, there were soccer teams, just like kids today. Uh, it's kind of hard to imagine, uh, you know, after the, you see liberation footage, uh, that that was what the vibrancy was like. The next film is actually from Berlin. It was taken in the early 1930s. Um, this is a family of, uh, there's a filmmaker, Ron Blau, who made a film called Our Time in the Garden. And this is the film of his family, the Bodenheimer film, uh, family. Um, the uh, gentleman with the cigar uh, is Sigmund uh, Bodenheimer, and he was a banker in Berlin. Um, and the moment that Hitler came to power, he decided, we are leaving. But look, they're in Switzerland, they're having a wonderful time, they're on vacation. Uh, this was just the normalcy of life for quite, um, you know, well-placed Berlin Jews. Uh, here they're, uh, you know, dining outside. It's absolutely wonderful with a white tablecloth. This is 
the early 1930s of a Berlin Jewish family. These are home movies. They were 16 millimeter. Uh, this is one of the ants, and uh, they're just you know clowning in front of the camera. Uh, just a wonderful one. And look, the fur coat that the ant had come to town. Just to give a little teeny snippet about how wonderful for some people Jewish life in Europe was before the war. All right, uh, hold on for just a moment, Dave, if you will. Okay, the next piece is a, uh, there's a series of five short films that were made in 1938 and 1939 by the Goskin brothers. Uh, Jewish Life in Vilna, Bialystok. I'm going to show you just a very short snippet of a film called Jewish Life in, it's called A Day in Warsaw. It's part of this little series. It's a 10 minute little travelogue, most of it shot outside because it was cheap to shoot outside, you didn't have to have lights inside. Um, and they give a wonderful small glimpse, whether it's the schools that the kids attended, whether it's the businesses, the marketplace, all those kinds of things. So I brought just a couple of minutes of A Day in Warsaw, 1938, 1939, just to give you a feel for what a wonderful city it was like before the war. Dave? Von dem Gefühl in die Schule, hat sie die bekannte Nordic Ski. Wie zum Mittel des Jungwerkstücks sich zum ersten nach Ruhe zu gehen. Die Geschäfte will eigentlich entläufen, es ist schade. In Kraschinski Gurten muss die Finde sich in seiner Hart von jüdischen Rajon ist gut auf Freude vom Schabitz. Machtlich Kinder verzweiten alles Tschechkolle von allein. Der Guten ist sehr rar. Die erwachsenen Jadler kennen sich, der steht und allein bestehen. Er spielen sich ergetandert und der Heu in US los zu tun. Er greifen sich zu wehren Sportchampionen zum leichter und schwerer Athletik. In guten gewältigen die Burg Kleininke. Hat drehen sich Meiderlöcher nach Karahot im Besingen der Basmauke im Städten der Mitten kein Geschmack an Schabesplätze. Soll es hier wohl bekommen. Kein Mauke mit der Krone auf dem Kopf, wird sie müsste mir nicht sein. Aber als Schönheitskönig in Epscherio. Die Pizimonkerler liegen in Wegerlöchern, während der Wacht durch drei jetzt zittert die kiedische Mann. Wie gewählt. Seht die Kinder, die da neu sind. Da kommen die Gestehen, muss das bescheiden die Welt. Epscher sagt, hat ein Muster von den Jungen so. Ihm ist gut, er hat dazu mich gemäht. Just a brief sample of the normalcy of that community. Think about New York, 1938, 1939. Very similar. 600,000 Jews, doctors, lawyers, uh, bankers, uh, every type of profession, hundreds of newspapers printed in Yiddish and Russian and you know every possible language. The Jewish community was thriving. Yes, there were poor people. Yes, there was anti-Semitism. But the diversity of the life and the culture is something that it, nobody could possibly imagine today from the images and from the information that went after the war. Okay, um, that's just a little teeny snippet of some of our holdings, and I would send you to our website, jewishfilm.org, from those of you who are from other communities to see maybe um, things that would interest you. Um, it's the things that we really love doing, and of course the Yiddish feature films, we've now restored 38 of those, uh, with Molly Picone and Maury Schwartz and Boris Tomaszewski. The range of those materials themselves are absolutely incredible as well. Flip side. Nazi propaganda materials. March 11, 1933. The exhibit just does a wonderful job of dealing with the kinds of materials that I'm gonna talk about right now. The Third Reich set up the Ministry of Propaganda. And as Goebbels says, quotes, for popular enlightenment and propaganda. And on March 28th, Goebbels gave a speech and an address to the German film industry, which was the height of production as far as its technical skills were concerned. And he declared, of all the arts, film is for us the most important. Uh, you'll see in the exhibit that there's a great deal of attention given to all of that. And during that period of time, there were approximately somewhere between 1,150 and 1,200, maybe 1,300 films that were produced under the aegis of the Third Reich. Only about a sixth of them were straight political propaganda of some kind. But every film had a political function. 
People were th to be manipulated, Goebbels thought, in every possible way. Minor characters, street signs, posters, insidiously in all of the materials that went through his hands. And you'll see in the exhibit whether it was postcards or newspapers or radio and certainly the films. There was a huge bureaucracy that was set up. Every single item passed through the hands of the Ministry of Propaganda. In this day and age, with the internet and with the kinds of multimedia that we are all bombarded with all the time, it's virtually impossible to understand that people were living in a society from 1933 on within the German Republic where every piece of information that they received was controlled by and was produced by a central authority. And of course, it had started way before in their practices of using manipulation all the way in the teens and the 20s as the Nazi party was building. But certainly between 1939 and 1945, during that period of time, when the Third Reich controlled everything, not only within Germany, but within all of those occupied areas, all of that information was totally controlled by this one central authority. So, of the films that were made, you know, let's say 1,200, 1,300 films, all right, 50 to 90 of them were overtly sort of, what I would say, xenophobic, nationalistic kinds of things, whether it was hiking in the mountains or um, doing sports or you know being a good neighbor or having <coughs> babies, the kinds of things to build up the positive side of what it means to be a wonderful German Aryan, a part of the community. That was part of the propaganda. But the obverse side, the negative materials, um, there were some that were anti-British, some that were anti-communist, some that were anti-American. There were only nine films that were overtly anti-Semitic. There were some newsreels. That's a whole different story, and it would take us hours to go through some of that material. But as far as the actual feature films that reached the theaters, there were only nine films that were made, um, two of which are dealt with in the exhibit, The Eternal Jew, which I'm going to deal with, but also Yud Zeus, which is very well dealt with within the exhibit itself. Uh, the other materials were, there was a film called a Robert and Bertram, another one, um, Linen from Ireland, The Rothschilds, Yud Zeus, which I mentioned, there was a film that was shot in the Warsaw Ghetto that was to be a documentary about the Warsaw Ghetto. To the best of our knowledge, it was not actually ever finished and actually ever shown. But the, the film material from it is very well known and has been recycled and recycled numerous times. Uh, the other films were um, uh, Uber Alice and Der Welt, Carl Peters, Homecoming, and Writing for Germany. My focus this evening, though, is the most notorious of all these materials, the Ebegyud, the Eternal Jew. It was shot by the Germans after they entered Poland. Much of the material was shot in and around the Lodge area, but also some of the materials are from other of the ghettos. Uh, remember, what they did is, once they came in, they established the ghettos, and they brought people into these small spaces, and food was scarce, so the people are starving, it's under terrible conditions, and as you will see, they selected the most horrific looking people that they could possibly find under the worst possible circumstances to make the film. And then, of course, they manipulated it through all of the editing techniques, the music, all those kinds of things. The film, by the way, is still banned in Germany. It can only be shown under very special educational circumstances. Um, I believe that our archive is the only uh, institution which has the legal rights to hold this. We also have the right to allow people at universities to use it. Unfortunately, with the internet and YouTube and all those kinds of things, um, there are copies out there. We keep notifying the German government and Transit Films, which is their uh, major um, institution that deals with these kinds of things, to please have them taken down. They take them down. They pop up again. I don't know if people think that they're doing a public service, uh, but the image 
pictures are pretty horrific. Uh, the film was used by the Third Reich as part of the campaign of genocide. Students, soldiers, large segments of the German population were ordered to see the film. I actually have met a number of German citizens, older people, who told us individual stories. One was at a university, their class was told and made to go and see the film. Another woman that I know from Holland said that they were told to go and see the film and she said she was sorry that she had seen it because she didn't think that ever again she could, you know, erase those images from her mind. Um, but it, in quotes, was not the most popular of all the films that the uh, Ministry of, Pop of uh, Propaganda made. Uh, their big deal is made of it. Some scholars say, oh, well, you, Zeus, was much more popular. It was only seen by about four and a half million people. So, uh, and in addition to that, the Wehrmacht and the Einsatzgruppen, the killing squads that were in the Eastern Front, um, they were shown the film the night before they were sent out to do the shooting squad. So it was a part of, it became a part of the whole mechanism uh, of the killing fields. Uh, it became one of the arsenals uh, in the weapon of the propaganda itself. Uh, the power of these negative images um, I think will you know, sear in your mind forever. Uh, even though we know rationally that they were taken of people who were incarcerated and that they were manipulated and that we are being manipulated as we watch it, nevertheless, I think, unfortunately, uh, it continues to work. Um, in 1940, um, well, just remember again about how controlling everything was during this period of time, how all of these means of communications, every single piece um, that came out was just you know, totally, totally um, under supervision and planned. As early as 1978, Lucy Davidovitz, in an article published in Yeshiva University magazine, said uh, about uh, there had been a film made by the BBC um, that she was criticizing, and she said that it raised questions about the origin and the use of film related to the study of the Holocaust, because this BBC series had used some of this material. Uh, they very carefully, in the narration, kept saying, this is Nazi propaganda material. Nevertheless, what you saw was the raw images themselves. So you had the images themselves, and then you heard in the narration that it's propaganda. But she was very critical of the BBC's use of it, because she said it raised questions about the origin of the film and the use of film and all Nazi propaganda film. She said that sequences deliberately and diabolically fabricated to produce photographic forgery of reality. All the images produced by the Ministry of Propaganda gravely distort historical reality. Most of those sequences were elaborately staged fakeries intended to serve the purposes of Nazi propaganda. Davidovitz went on to say, the images of the Jews which persist in our mind are the very images which the Nazi propagandists originally wished to impress on the minds of their viewers. Dave, will you please show the first sequence, which is really the first, the opening sequences of The Eternal Jew. It has sound. Uh, by the way, this is a, uh, a very bad copy. It's uh, a video with time code that we only use for researchers, so the quality is not um, of the original, but you'll, you'll get the idea. in Polen hat uns Gelegenheit gegeben, das Judentum an seiner Niststätte kennenzulernen. Fast vier Millionen Juden leben hier in Polen. Allerdings wird man sie unter der bäuerlichen Bevölkerung vergeblich suchen. 
Sie haben auch nicht unter den Wirren des Krieges zu leiden gehabt, wie die eingeborene polnische Bevölkerung. Sie saßen wie Unbeteiligte in den dunklen Ghettogassen der polnischen Städte und eine Stunde nach der deutschen Besetzung machten sie schon wieder ihre Geschäfte. Deutschen haben schon vor 25 Jahren einmal Gelegenheit gehabt, einen Blick in das polnische Ghetto zu werfen. Diesmal aber ist unser Blick durch die Erfahrungen der letzten Jahrzehnte geschärft. Wir sehen nicht mehr wie 1914 bloß das Groteske und Komische an diesen fragwürdigen Gestalten des Ghettos. Wir erkennen, dass hier ein Pestherd liegt, der die Gesundheit der arischen Völker bedroht. Richard Wagner hat einmal gesagt, der Jude ist der plastische Dämon des Verfalls der Menschheit. Und diese Bilder bestätigen die Richtigkeit seines Ausspruchs. Zusammenleben der Juden zeigt einen auffallenden Mangel an selbstschöpferischer Zivilisationsfähigkeit. Auf Deutsch gesagt, die jüdischen Behausungen sind unsauber und verwahrlost. Man muss bedenken, dass diese Juden nicht etwa arm sind. Durch jahrzehntelangen Handel haben sie genug Geld angehäuft, um sich und ihrer Familie ein sauberes und behagliches Heim schaffen zu können. Aber sie wohnen Generationen hindurch in denselben schmutzigen und verwandten Wohnlöchern. Dort halten sie auch unbekümmert um die weihelose Umgebung ihre zeremoniell hergesagten Gebete ab. Die Pendelbewegungen des Oberkörpers gehören zum vorschriftsmäßigen Lesen jüdischer Schriften. Notice the strident music, the careful selection of some of the most grotesque and unattractive faces that seen near the end. Oh, hold for a moment, Dave, if you would. Um, that scene near the end where they go inside the home. It's an obvious, you know, set up scene. Um, people at the table, the crazy narration over it. The Jews have money, they just don't use it. Cut away to, you know, lice and just, you know, despicable kinds of things. Back again, forcing these guys, you know, who, you know, were religious Jews to daven in front of the camp. I mean, the, 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 the look in their eyes, I mean, it's just, you know, you can see in that sequence alone just the gross manipulation of setting up of the scene, the staging of it, the way in which it's done. Uh, the next scene that we're going to see actually takes place in a synagogue. Um, a group of men were forced into uh, a synagogue building, a service takes place, we'll let it run for a couple of minutes just so you can get kind of the feel of it. But notice the look on the faces of the men. They look at the camera and you can only imagine that next to the cameraman is a guy with a gun. Who knows under what circumstances, what people had to endure, but you can see in the stark fear in these men's faces. But then look at the young boys who are looking at the camera as well. So Dave, if you'll play the next scene, please. Thank you.
Schachern mitten im Gottesdienst ist für die Israeliten keine Entheiligung. Sagt doch das Gesetz, wer die Tora ehrt, dessen Geschäfte gelingen. Die Tora-Rolle, welche die fünf Bücher Moses mit dem Gesetz enthält, wird aus der sogenannten Heiligen Lade genommen. Auf dem Wege zur Kanzel küssen die gläubigen Juden die Tora-Rolle, um damit Vergebung ihrer Sünden zu erlangen. We know that after this scene was taken, all of the people that were made to participate were taken out, put on cattle cars, and shipped off to the camps. The next scene uh, is really very difficult. Uh, I debated whether or not to show it um, and discussed it even with Gene Zeldin. Um, Please, you know, some of you, if it's too difficult, just kind of close your eyes, for, at least for the first minute of it. Um, it's the infamous rat scene. Um, it's one that certainly sears in my mind, uh, and I always struggle whether or not to show it in my classes or not. Um, but it was such an integral part of the whole ideology and the whole philosophy and the whole genocide use of this material. Um, that I think it's important to show. Um, and it's been used over and over again. I remember, oh, it's probably 15 years ago, I had a long and very difficult and contentious discussion with Bill Moyer. Uh, he was actually interviewing Fritz Hippler, the director of this film. It was in probably the year 2001, 2000, something like that. Um, and he insisted upon showing this sequence. He didn't get it from us. I don't know where he got it. And I begged him not to. He was going out on national television. Why? Why did you need to? Um, anyway, I lost on that one. Um, but um, I do think it's important for you to see it and uh, the uh, sequences that follow, because the sequences that follow, um, not only is it the careful selection of you know, these people who are incarcerated under you know, the most terrible of circumstances, but you can see in their eyes exactly, it's their only sort of way of pleading uh, of that they know what's going on and they have no control over what's going on. And you will see in the final sequences, um, there are religious men with payas and beard who are clean shaven and under no circumstances would they have allowed their person to be defiled in this kind of way. Uh, but this is all part and parcel of the entire piece, which runs about an hour and 10 minutes. So um, Dave, if you'll show this, this also does have the sound uh, to go with it. <coughs> Die Ratten begleiten als Schmarotze den Menschen von seinen Anfängen an, Asien. Von dort aus wandern sie in riesigen Scharen über Russland und die Balkanländer nach Europa. Mitte des 18. Jahrhunderts sind sie schon über ganz Europa verbreitet. Gegen Ende des 19. Jahrhunderts nehmen sie mit dem wachsenden Schiffsverkehr auch von Amerika Besitz und ebenso von Afrika und dem fernen Osten. Thank you. 
Wo Ratten auch auftauchen, tragen sie Vernichtung ins Land, zerstören sie menschliche Güter und Nahrungsmittel. Auf diese Weise verbreiten sie Krankheiten, Pest, Lepra, Typhus, Cholera, Ruhr und so weiter. Sie sind hinterlistig, feige und grausam und treten meist in großen Scharen auf. Sie stellen unter den Tieren das Element der heimtückischen unterirdischen Zerstörung dar. Nicht anders als die Juden unter den Menschen. Das Parasitenvolk der Juden stellt einen großen Teil des internationalen Verbrechertums. So betrug 1932 der Anteil der Juden, die nur ein Prozent der Weltbevölkerung ausmachen, am gesamten Rauschgifthandel der Welt 34 Prozent. An Kassendiebstählen 47 Prozent. An Falsch- und Glücksspielvergehen 47 Prozent. An internationalen Diebesbanden 82 Prozent. Am Mädchenhandel 98 Prozent. Die Fachausdrücke des internationalen Gauner- und Verbrecherjargons stammen nicht ohne Grund aus dem Hebräischen und Jiddischen. Diese Physiognomien widerlegen schlagend die liberalistische Theorie von der Gleichheit alles dessen, was Menschenantlitz trägt. Freilich wandeln sie ihr Äußeres, wenn sie von der polnischen Niststätte in die reiche Welt hinaus gelangen. Pais und Bar, Kappe und Kaftan kennzeichnen den Ostjuden für jedermann. Legt er sie ab, so erkennen nur schärfer blickende Menschen seine rassische Herkunft. Es ist ein wesentliches Charaktermerkmal des Juden, dass er immer bestrebt ist, seine Abstammung zu verbergen, wenn er sich unter Nichtjuden bewegt. Gruppe von polnischen Juden, eben noch Kaftanträger und nun in westeuropäischer Kleidung, bereit, sich in die westliche Zivilisation einzuschleichen. Natürlich wissen sich diese Ghetto-Juden zunächst noch nicht richtig in den sauberen europäischen Anzügen zu bewegen. So what is the impact of these negative visual images, the starving, grotesque images? Actually, we know very little about the impact of visual images. There have been loads of studies that have been done by psychologists and psychiatrists and all kinds of media studies. Um, they're really pretty inconclusive. Um, there's a lot of studies that have been done with young people, especially teenagers, and violence to see whether or not there's some, you know, kind of immediate reaction. You show certain kinds of violent things, and then, you know, is there a spillover to the behavior of the people? Um, lots of questions that it raises. You know, are moving images different in kind than other forms of information that we receive? Is it possible to counter? or correct visual material with audio information and factual information. Um, what visual material really, you know, has had some of the greatest impact, those of you in the audience? When I teach my courses on sort of, you know, impacts of visual images, I always ask my students, so, so uh, you know, what, um, what film do you remember? What television? You know, what has had the greatest impact on your life? And you know, 10 or 15 years ago, when I would ask the question invariably, uh, I would get an answer from the students, um, the blowing up of the Challenger. Why? Because when those students had been in grade school, they had all been gathered around in their classrooms around the television set because the teacher, Christopher, was on that flight. And so they remember that horrific situation 
of the challenger up and here was this teacher in the whole thing but of course in recent years it's 9-11 which and we will more memorialize tomorrow those images don't go away for those of us who stood in front of those television sets and saw those planes entering those buildings and those people leaping out of it the searing into our minds what kind of an impact do visual images have um, we don't have a lot of answers to that but I think that some of these horrific negative images are extremely difficult in the best educational circumstances um, to counter them and to get rid of them okay uh, before we go on to take your questions there's one other very important film that was made by the Third Reich that I wanted to share with you and to just introduce and talk a little bit about. And that's The Fuhrer Gives the City to the Jews, to Fuhrer Schenk den Juden an Stadt. Hitler Gives the City to the Jews. This was a film that was made in 1943-44 uh, in the camp at Theresienstadt. And it was for the exact opposite purpose. The Nazis were making a film to show the world that they were taking very good care of all the Jews that they had deported from the various towns. And so from start to finish, not only was the, the film is a part of the whole propaganda scheme, but it's everything within it uh, was kind of staged and set up. And so I brought a short clip of that. Now what our archive has done, we've restored the original 16 minutes that had been found near Prague and uh, subsequent to that a few in the 1990s there was a wonderful art exhibit that was put together by the Mass College of Art and on one side of it it showed the artwork that had been done uh, under duress uh, about how wonderful life was like um, by many of the Jewish artists. And then on the other side of the exhibit was what was really going on and the wonderful hidden artwork that these brave Jewish artists had made and had hidden or smuggled out from Theresienstadt. And so during that period of time, we also found eight more minutes of film that had been actually shot in Theresienstadt and we pieced it back together with the help of a gentleman, uh, Carl Margri, who's at the University of Utrecht. And so we actually have 23 minutes of the reconstructed little film. We know that more was shot, a lot of it has been lost, but there's now 23 minutes that can be used as a teaching tool. But we were concerned at our center that the film, no matter who used it or under what circumstances, because it's a total lie from start to finish. So you will see that in the upper right hand corner, we actually burned into all of our copies staged Nazi film, because there was no way that we were going to let this out uh, and have it misused in any way. So Dave, if you'll play this one further clip, it has sound um, with subtitles that we created at the center. Um, Fear gives the city to the Jews, 1944. Those of you who know this is Be Mr. Shane, which is a very famous Yiddish song, which is a huge irony to be shown in this film. Looks like a great vacation spot, doesn't it? Notice how people are not lucky to get the camera.
danno del libro. of young kids um, most likely were from Bialystok. Um, during this period of time, a shipment of young kids had come in. Uh, they were later immediately shipped off to some of the camps. Uh, Theresienstadt itself, um, 140,000 Jews were sent to Theresien. Uh, 33,430 died there, and another 87,000 were shipped to the death camps in the east. Um, there were a few survivors more there than any of the other camps, and so there's copious documentation. Uh, the Holocaust Museum has it, uh, Yad Vashem, lots of other places of survivors about when, where, and how each of those scenes was shot, and how it's all you know, complete fabrication, complete lies. Um, Anton Keyes, a German scholar concerned with history and film um, has written copiously about images and uh, specifically in relation to, there was a TV series called Winds of War, uh, notes that images of images circulate in an eternal cycle, an endless loop, validating and reconfirming each other. Cinematic images have created a technological bank that is shared by everyone and offers little escape. It increasingly shapes and legitimizes our perception of the past. History itself, so it seems, has been democratized by these, essential, these easily accessible images. But the power over what is shared as popular memory has passed into the hands of those who produce those images. The power over what is shared as popular memory has passed into the hands of those who now produce those images. Okay, can film as a medium provide a different, a special, or a new kind of evidence, insight, knowledge, or understanding about the Holocaust? What is the impact of these negative visual images of Jews as taken and reshown and reshown of Jews? Does film play a unique role in this historical event? Must we look at it, must we see it in order to believe it? Can the images of Jews created by the Nazis represent any aspect of the historical experience itself? Can one avoid the eroticization of the horror of this material? Are history and memory of the Holocaust being created now by the filmmakers of today? And what is the impact of the images of the survivors, the victimization of the Jew? Just a few questions, and now I'll open it up for your questions. Thank you.
As you may notice, there are microphones on either end at the bottom of the stairs. If you have questions, we would invite you to come down these stairs and uh, come up to one of these microphones. If you are outside in our overflow area and you have a question, we would invite you to come inside as well. If you need me to come to you with the microphone, I am happy to do so, but we would certainly appreciate if everyone would talk into the microphone so that we can catch that on the recordings that you can catch later on on the Midwest Center for Holocaust Education website. And I think I gave you just enough time, sir. That's fine. Uh, thank you so much for coming here today. I've got uh, a, kind of a two-part question, uh, one of which is uh, what role, if any, did Lenny Riefenstahl play in the creation of the uh, uh, movies made during the uh, the Third Reich. I know that you know, obviously she you know made Triumph for the Real and Olympiad, but were there other propaganda films that she was associated with? And, and the second part is is that um, I'm not quite sure why you are so zealously holding copies of you know things like the Eternal Jew when it seems to me that uh, widespread dissemination of those images would be much more helpful in keeping these kinds of things from uh, having problems in the future. Uh, both very good questions. The Lenny Riefenstahl um, is very interesting. Uh, that's in the part of the xenophobic, the building up of. Uh, she made a, a, a film pro of, a, of a Nazi rally prior to the one that she did of the Sixth Party Congress, uh, and she then she made Olympia. She went on to make films, by the way, but uh, she she also did uh, uh, participate in the production of Tiefland, uh, and in that film, which was done at the very end of um, you know uh, uh, of the war uh, she actually brought into the film some of the gypsy children um, from a concentration camp and made them participate in the film itself of course she claimed all along that she had absolutely nothing to do with any of the negative propaganda all that kind of thing all of it was a total lie um, she was tried after the war and she was exonerated and was not um, incarcerated in any way. She went on to make films, I think she was 96. Uh, there's actually a fabulous documentary called The Wonderful, Horrible Life of Lenny Riefenstahl. Uh, it's made by some German producers. It's absolutely terrific. You can get it on DVD or probably you know, uh, off of the net. It tells her story. Uh, I always say, as I told people earlier, she's the woman that I love to hate the most because as a filmmaker and as a woman, she was absolutely extraordinary as far as her skills were well, concerned. I think she probably was the greatest filmmaker of her time. Uh, well, technically, but she was also one of the biggest liars and cheats and blah, 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 of other things. But she also, in her 90s, was doing underwater photography and had this, you know, this this gorgeous German guy that she was living with that was 30 years younger than she was. I mean, she was just, you know, as a human being, but I mean, she was just, you know, I, I won't use any of that language tonight, but I mean, just, you know, absolutely despicable human being and lies to the I camera. gotta follow that up though at the end of her life she does the book life among the Nuba and do you believe that that was her way of apologizing for what she had done earlier absolutely not uh, look at the wonderful horrible world of Lenny Reef and you can see sort of through her lies and her obfuscation she knew damn well what she was doing you know she was in cahoots all the way with these guys, the public records show it. She had her own company that was funded, uh, it wasn't funded directly. And in fact, Janus Films in the United States owns the copyright to some of her, you know, Olympia and, and Triumph of the Will. She received money for those films later on. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, uh, she uh, absolutely knew exactly what she was doing the entire time. Um, she was a great actress, and as you will see her in her 90s in this documentary, I mean, she just loved going back to all the places and sort of being the actress and the whole thing. Uh, she also participated as an actress in things. So uh, I think she was part of, and it, but it was the build up of, except for the, the, the piece that she did in Tiefland, um, which there was no question in this documentation. She denied it completely. Oh, she didn't know who those kids were. She didn't know where they came from. All of it was a total lie. Uh, and it's well documented. And there was a, uh, a Hans-Peter Kochenrath, a German filmmaker who worked for ZEF, who actually made 
made that film and he was the one that just wouldn't let it go and in quotes had, had to prove it. Um, the question about to show this film, not to show the film, the releasing of it. The German government itself does not allow this film to be shown openly in Germany. It's only in educational situations, um, in classrooms, you have to have licenses for it, and my license and my agreement with the Bundesarchiv and with the German government is exactly the same. We are allowed to, if um, Jean Zeldin and the Holocaust Center uh, here, uh, education needs it to show to teachers, uh, we'll work with them, they can have you know legal copies of it, but uh, I'm not allowed to, uh, to release it to the general public. And quite honestly, I I think that these images are damning enough, this is my own personal feeling, that it's so difficult and under what circumstances, if somebody's just teaching a course in World War II and wants to just show it as an example, I don't think it's a particularly good idea. I think if they're teaching a course of six weeks or 10 weeks or you know, 13 weeks, which is most, what most college classes are, then okay. Then there's you have an entire semester to show images before, to show other kinds of things, to explain exactly. First of all, the images of those religious Jews and the way their bodies are desecrated, I'm not sure that, you know, I really want sort of that to be general out there. I think it's a, a desecration to those people. They didn't have a choice. They were taken under, um, they were incarcerated. You, you can see in their faces, they're almost pleading with you. Like, you know, please, you know, what's happening to me? And they can't do anything. And so I don't want to be the one, basically, to perpetuate that which Goebbels and the Ministry of Propaganda tried to perpetrate. To use it in a controlled situation where you have time and people can read books and they can have photographs and they can have other kinds of information that will help counter, okay, but just for general distribution, general out there, um, I, would, I would come down on the no side, but thank you for the question. Thank you. Um, in The Eternal Jew, which was taken by, um, uh, which, which is a film that we hold in their center, um, which was a Yiddish feature film made by a, a Jewish filmmaker, Joseph Green, um, for Jewish audiences in the Yiddish language, which was then used uh, as part of Nazi propaganda. And um, if you could speak a little bit about that. Uh, that was Lisa Rebo, the co-director of the center, uh, because I forgot to put it into my, yes. Um, when the Nazis moved into um, Poland, uh, they took all the film they wanted, they took anything they wanted, they brought it back to the Bundesarchiv, where a lot of it still resides. Uh, <clears throat> in fact, we just uh, accomplished a uh, 15, 20 year struggle to have some of the materials returned. Uh, Joseph Green was a, uh, a filmmaker who had been born in Poland, immigrated to the United States, and in 1936 went back to Poland to make four Yiddish feature films, including Yiddel Mythis Vittel with Molly Picon uh, and Mamala. And a third film that he made uh, was called Pormspiel, and it was one of the four films that they took from the archive or wherever they found the prints and they brought them back to Berlin. And um, they actually cut into the Eternal Jew a scene from um, that film uh, and it shows a group of Jews sitting around a table during Purim all dressed up in their costumes and eating and they're eating a lot and so they used it to show how grotesque look at these people they you know they look funny they're eating and you know all that kind of stuff so they actually used materials that had been made by Jews for Jewish entertainment um, in, you know, Trinity, and of course I'm sure they were laughing the entire time. Uh, of course without rights because it was absolutely stolen material. Um, and uh, so it has taken us a long time, but we finally have succeeded in getting those materials returned from the German government. Uh, there was a some pushback. Again, they wanted us to kind of pay for it, uh, and we said, no, we're not going to pay for the return of materials that uh, actually Joe Green had gifted um, all of the rights and all of the materials to his four films to our archive. And so I said, hey guys, you know, we, we ain't going to pay you um, to give us back materials that you stole and that you used, and not only that, that you desecrated and used in this, uh, in this terrible film. So that, um, at any rate, uh, uh, just, just a, a little footnote in history. 
Now, I'm certain that there are some more questions still out there and that those questions can be addressed afterwards. And right now, I'd like to invite Dr. Naylor back up to the podium. Sure. Ladies and gentlemen, what a delightful and important evening this has been. Sharon, thank you for uh, walking us through a difficult conversation this evening. What an important topic, and we're so glad to have had so many of you here uh, to join us in this. We look forward to welcoming you next Wednesday with uh, Dr. Chris Clark, and on October 1 for the continuation of the series. Thank you and good night.